Hi, it's Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 26th year in business. It's late Friday afternoon, February 27, 2015, and the title of today's audio blog is Temporary Suspension of Disbelief. Now, the reason I have increased the quantity of audio, audio blogs lately are many fold, starting with the fact that many people, through either convenience or cognitive preference, choose to download information audibly via either uh, desktops, tablets, smartphones, or Bluetooth. And regarding the, la the latter, Reader Mike has been kind enough to download my podcasts and audio blogs to a free website at silverfarm.podbean.com for those looking for the MP3 format. However, an equally powerful motive has been the need to cover so many diverse topics simultaneously, given just how rapidly the worldwide horrible headlines are rolling in. Frankly, it's difficult to keep up on a daily basis, which is why it's so incredible that yesterday's literary house of horrors, titled Hideously Ominous Developments as Far as the Eye Can See, doesn't hold a candle to what I'm about to discuss today. Hopefully, when readers are considering investments in the precious metal arena, they consider just how much financial and human resources Miles Franklin puts in to its educational efforts. As for today's episode, I'm again writing from the Monkey Business Indoor Playground, where the strain of writing of such dire issues is fortunately counteracted by the joy of watching Sylvie play so happily, as of yet ignorant of the difficult world she inhabits. Like most of you, family is the most important aspect of our existences, and hopefully we can all enjoy it to the best of our abilities. Anyhow, regarding the title of today's audio blog, I utilized a term coined two centuries ago by Samuel Coleridge of man's ability to suspend judgment of a story's implausibility if at least it has some human interest and semblance of truth. Well, I'll let you decide how much truth exists in today's commandeered and manipulated political and economic world. However, as for human interest, there's no lack of abundance there, as seven plus billion people are living through an historic economic tragedy, with many already experiencing the brunt of the storm, and the rest sitting unsuspectingly within its eye. To that end, never can I recall a time where I had such difficulty finding a starting point for an article, as unquestionably there are more cataclysmic, precious metal bullish items to discuss than at any time since the 2008 crisis. Only this time around, the global economic, financial, and geopolitical environment is far more precarious, with essentially zero cushion to fall back on. As today, not only are individuals, corporations, and municipalities bankrupt, but so are sovereign nations and central banks. Not to mention, as the final currency war rages, uh, has gone nuclear, ensuring that the pace of global fiat currency collapse accelerates dramatically. And given that introduction, where have I chosen to start? Appropriately, with the man who started it all, when following his appointment as Fed Chairman in 1987, he commenced the time-honored fiat currency mad experiment of trying to prevent any and all financial and economic declines with the exponentially increased money printing that has destroyed the global economy and 99% of its denizens. Yes, Maestro Greenspan, in stepping up his effort to distance himself from the carnage he created, followed up last fall's stunning admission that gold is the world's most powerful currency in stating that, quote, and this was yesterday, global effective demand is extraordinarily weak, tantamount to the late stages of the Great Depression. Yes, the man who was Fed Chairman just nine years ago and wrote Golden Economic Freedom 49 years ago is committing the ultimate taboo in not only selling out Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, but admitting to the world that not only has the Fed failed, but done so miserably. Clearly, Janet Yellen agrees, as per last week's dovishly doctored January 28th FOMC minutes and Tuesday's most unequivocally dovish FOMC statement in memory, per the title of Tuesday's audio blog, the Fed is finally if implicitly admitting that what the Miles Franklin blog has said all along, i.e. the U.S. economy is crashing with the entire world and only unprecedented market and economic data manipulation has prevented widespread realization of such. Inevitably, the long-awaited Yellen reversal will finish off once and for all the last shards of credibility the manipulated financial markets have enabled the Federal Reserve to retain. And when it arrives via a massive QE4 and likely negative interest rates, if you think the final currency war is bad now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Regarding said economic crash, 
Today saw perhaps the most damning evidence yet, which frankly even shocked me when I saw it published at 9.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But before I get to the economic devastation portended by today's mind-bogglingly horrible Chicago PMI reading, let me recap the ugly economic data of the past 24 hours, which unquestionably, recovery, is absolutely the last word I'd used to describe its intimation. Yesterday, we started with durable goods orders, depicting a barely positive ex-transportation result, which frankly is far better than the actual negative numbers we've seen in everything from retail sales to construction spending, factory orders, personal consumption, and essentially everything measuring real economic activity. However, the meager 0.3% gain following last month's 0.8% contraction was the best news we'd see, as directly thereafter, Jobless claims had their biggest weekly surge in three months, the Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index its biggest plunge in 10 months, the Kansas City Fed Manufacturing Index followed by falling from 3 to, to 1, validating the ugly results from last week's Dallas and Richmond surveys, and the CPI had its first negative reading since the Lehman crisis, prompting New York Fed President uh, Jim Dudley or Bill Dudley to validate Janet Yellen's commitment to ZERP by predicting inflation will sit below the Fed's 2% objective for, quote, some time, which, in my view, sounds a lot like the considerable time phrase they supposedly got rid of. That said, I haven't even scratched the surface of the truly ugly stuff, or for that matter, even, even mentioned the atrocious Japanese data re released last night, featuring a 2% plunge in retail sales, a 5% collapse in household spending, and a 6% surge in Japan's all but socialized unemployment rate. Clearly, until this morning's all-out economic data horror show, the aforementioned were easily overshadowed by the utter explosion of U.S. and global crude oil data, depicting all-time high production and inventories despite collapsing rig counts and energy capital expenditures. <clears throat> and nowhere is the supply response I wrote of last week going to be more cataclysmic than the United States of junk bond finance ultra-high-cost shale production, where crude inventories hit an 80-year high even, and even Goldman Sachs is forecasting $30 per barrel oil, which is exactly where it's going, as per what I wrote in January 2nd's must-read, direst prediction of all article, overcapacity caused by cheap Fed credit and predatory Wall Street financing will likely destroy commodity markets of all kinds for years to come. Except, of course, gold and silver, which care of decades of cartel suppression, are on the verge of an all-out production collapse in the face of record demand with not a chance of equilibrium for years to come. In fact, the oil situation is so dire, irrespective of the, of the new oil PPT's maniacal paper defense of WTI $49 per barrel, top MSM cheerleader Yahoo Finance's top story this morning, written by none other than the Pied Piper of Market CNBC, was titled, Are Oil Producers Running Out of Space? Yes, my friends, there is literally so much oil in the market right now, to the tune of nearly 1.5 million barrels per day of surplus, that there may no longer be any storage space left. In fact, I just got an email from one of my readers in Texas who said that the, one, of the, uh, one of the ports near the Gulf has 80 ships full of oil waiting for places to put it. Which is why, when yet another mainstream apologist, Bank of America, which happens to be one of the two largest bailout recipients of all time, has its head of commodity research saying the following, this morning, I might add, you'd better take heed. Quote, we're going to see pretty fast inventory builds over the next few weeks. If you run out of space, prices tend to react a lot more violently to adjust that supply and demand imbalance, and that's what we expect over the next few weeks. And heck, we haven't even gotten to today's economic news, let alone the cater of global horrible headlines that dwarf it in importance. Starting with fourth quarter GDP growth, if you want to believe completely meaningless fudge numbers in the first place, being revised from 2.6% to 2.2%. And not only does this revision place 2014 GDP growth at exactly the same 2.2% level as in 2012 and 2013, recovery notwithstanding, but it was even uglier when you consider that it would have been weaker if reduced fourth quarter spending in real economic categories wasn't offset by further increased increases in estimated health care spending, which at 22% was by far the largest fourth quarter spending component, dwarfing all others. And don't forget, health care was also by far the largest spending category in the third quarter, 
care of the beneficial accounting impact of Obamacare. Too bad it's not actual economic output, or that aside from the healthcare industry, which just happens to be the largest government lobbyer, no one actually economically benefited from it. Which brings me to the Chicago PMI, which no doubt Worley Bird Janet had inside information on before giving her historically dovish Humphrey Hawkins testimony Tuesday. To that end, when I wrote Island of Lies last year, I discussed how certain economic data points were more fudged than others. None more than the monthly NFP employment report, of course, but a close second are the so-called diffusion indices that try to gauge the activity of a 300 million person economy by serving a handful of politically motivated people with loaded, uh, statistically insignificant questions and seasonally adjusted answers that always seem to seasonally adjust upward. Moreover, no such index has been more of an island of lies tool in the Chicago PMI, uh, and by the way, Chicago got downgraded to nearly junk status by Moody's today, which despite all of the other diffusion indices starting to roll over and or sharply decline, the Chicago PMI has continued to pretend the economy was running strongly. Well, when I saw this morning's number, my jaw actually dropped, and frankly, it still sits on the floor nearly three hours later. Yes, my friends, the vaunted Chicago PMI not only missed expectations of falling from a ridiculously unrealistic 59.4 to 58.7, but plunged all the way to, drumroll please, 45.8, depicting a nation hopelessly in recession. Which, of course, is exactly what is the case. Yes, 45.8, a level last seen in July 2009, following its largest monthly plunge since the heart of the Lehman crisis in October 2008, and largest new orders plunge on record. And this coinciding with publication of the largest consumer sentiment plunge in 16 months. Frankly, I'm still in awe as to how the U.S. government allowed such an ugly number to be published. But again, the, unst the unstoppable tsunami of reality is becoming more and more powerful each day, and economic mother nature more and more angry at what a handful of sociopathic bankers and politicians have done to a natural order that must be returned to normal. As you can see, the damage across the so-called strongest economy is as deep as it is broad, and I haven't even discussed the cat catastrophic ramifications of the stronger dollar, resulting not from U.S. economic strength, but as I've been claiming ad nauseum, due solely to global fear that the big one is upon us, yielding capital to flow into the world's most liquid markets, which include gold and silver, of course, although government naked shorting in the paper markets has temporarily offset record demand in the physical markets. In the beginning of 2014, i.e. last year, I predicted this terrifying currency market development for all parties involved would occur, and followed up by predicting more of the same in my 2015 predictions audio blog, which is exactly what has happened, and then some. As I write, the dollar is sitting on the cusp of a new 12-year high, and this despite all the aforementioned horrifying economic data. And no, it's not just the euro that surge, it's surging against, which I'll get to momentarily, but all global currencies, some like the Brazilian real in truly terrifying fashion, and others like the Ukrainian Rivnia in hyperinflationary fashion. All along, I have claimed that the strong dollar will not only destroy countless nation states, but would utterly torpedo U.S. corporate earnings, which are already amidst their first year-over-year -year decline since 2008. And this, despite unprecedented accounting chicanery and debt finance, but earnings per share boosting, share buybacks. Which is why it was so comical to see everyone's favorite buffoon, propagandist and liar, James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, claiming the strong dollar, dollar's effect on the U.S. economy is marginal and shouldn't inhibit growth. Perhaps you should look at the chart Zero Hedge published yesterday, comparing the dollar index to S&P 500 earnings estimates with its essentially 100% correlation. To that end, in last month's most ominous quote of the year, I wrote that the U.S. would not, and could not, allow itself to lose the final currency war to an exploding dollar. And thus, it shouldn't surprise anyone just how dovish Janet Yellen's congressional testimony this week was. Back to the plunging euro. Exactly how much clearer do I need to be that a Grexit is in the cards, likely by year end? And moreover, how much more obvious can it be that the only reason an all-out stock bond and currency implosion, the world wound, hasn't consumed the world in biblical fashion yet, yet, 
is due to the most maniacal, unrelenting, transparent, and arrogant market manipulation scheme in history. I mean, is anyone reading the headlines, much less my commentary, of how fraudulent the Greek deal was in the first place, how impossible it is for them, or any of the pigs for that matter, to pay off their debt, how nothing can or will change in four months' time, how the Greek energy minister yesterday claimed he will not pay heed to said deal's austerity demands, or how the Greek people are on the verge of violent revolution per the anti-government rallies going on in Athens today. To wit, this morning alone, as Germany's Bundestag rubber-stamped Greece's and the Eurogroup's four-month stay of execution, it appears one of Greece's largest banks may have run out of money, as the stock of its act and the stock of its actual largest bank, the National Bank of Greece, which I have deemed the world's most insolvent financial institution, has seen its stock plunge 25% since said deal was announced Monday. Moreover, the mainstream news is littered with articles of how Greece and its banks won't even survive through the four-month extension period without another massive bailout, and potentially could default within weeks. Readers, there's a reason why the euro is in all-out freefall this morning, to, be to below 1.12 to the dollar, as nearly the lows set, which were nearly the lows set right after Syriza's election victory. And yes, I predicted it two weeks ago as loudly as I could. Again, I cannot be more positive that a Grexit is in the cards. Frankly, I don't see how, how even the world's biggest financial, economic, and political manipulators can prevent it from occurring. My year-end Revenge of the People prediction is going to occur by hook or crook. And in Greece's case, not only are the people as angry as any on the planet, but care largely of Eurogroup, ECB, and IMF policies are flat broke as well. And then we have the markets, which frankly are no longer markets at all, but 100% 24-7 manipulations. Well, at least last-to-go markets like the major stock indices controlled by the world's largest central banks in, for example, the U.S., Europe, Japan, and China. And, of course, the paper, gold, and silver markets, which despite last year's prosecutions for manipulations in London and this week's U.S. and Swiss regulatory accusations of such in New York and Zurich still trade day in and day out in the polar opposite fashion, like the aforementioned stock indices of what fundamentals dictate. That said, the powers that be have indeed lost control of the vast majority of financial markets, as currencies, commodities, and of course crude oil have plummeted into oblivion, with no hope of reversal and a global economic conflagration that will only exacerbate such trends with each passing day. I have written of all these topics ad nauseum, including the new oil PPT, which roughly three weeks ago undertook an inevitably losing effort to hold WTI crude above $49 per barrel, and thus will not rehash all the particulars here, although I am extremely intrigued by the battle going on at 2.0% on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, which by all accounts should be plunging like those of Germany, Japan, and other major Western powers toward zero, but for some reason is finding support. In fact, as I, as I write right now, it's literally 1.995%. Is the Fed desperately trying to prevent universal recognition of the most damning proof of QE failure yet of QE failure I wrote of last May? particularly following Yellen's uber-dovish testimony and the aforementioned horrific economic data? Is it the recent acceleration of Chinese treasury selling? Or is it some other sinister reason we're not yet aware of? Frankly, I, I don't know, but suffice to say there has never been a time where the manipulation of everything not nailed down has so dramatically deformed the global political, economic, and financial landscape and caused such dramatically wealth dis just dramatic wealth disparity that the seeds of, of revolution are so ripe for blossoming. And I do believe that the rate on the 10-year is going to fall way below uh, its lows of 1.6 and, and head toward the German and Japan levels uh, that are closer to zero right now. And before I go, two more items I'd like to address. First, we have tomorrow's, that is Saturday's, submission of the annual Indian budget, the first since Narendra Modi's BJP party swept into office last May, in large part given their opposition to the anti-gold, pro-rupee stance of the former Congress party government. Well, the broad expectation is that the 10% gold and silver tariffs instituted in 2013 will be partly, if not mostly, repealed. And if they are, you can bet Indian gold imports, exploding black market notwithstanding, will utterly explode, particularly as the rupee, the rupee is again under pressure. And last but not least, I wanted to continue yesterday's refutation of the silly, specious claims of one of the industry's most dangerously inconsistent newsletter writers, that during deflation, gold is a terrible place to invest. 
In that article, I refuted essentially everything he claimed with ease, whilst ignoring his ridiculous prediction of Dow 31,000 entirely, but wanted to follow up with a bit of empirical and recent empirical data to support my conclusion. To that end, I calculated the price change of gold and a variety of other deflation-sensitive markets from the day WTI crude peaked last year on June 13th at 107.50 per barrel to the day it bottomed, at least for now, on January 29th at 43.80 per barrel. During those seven months, Wilt's crude plunged 59%, the 10-year Treasury yield 35%, the CRB Commodity Index 31% to nearly its 2008 spike low, and copper by 20, 20%. And you know how gold did during this time? Yes, it was unchanged. And that with the cartel capping every attempt to surge and attacking on every possible occasion. Well, that's enough for now, as even I have my limits. Hopefully the sum total of what I, Bill Holter, and the economic truth-seeking community helps you to understand just how little rope remains in the financial and economic uh, community. And thus, just how close we are to seeing what is occurring in second and third world nations now reaching first world shores shortly. To that end, the protection of your hard-earned savings with real money, i.e. physical gold and silver, has never been more imperative. And if you decide to take action by buying or storing precious metals, we hope you'll call Miles Franklin at 